Hello, I'm Alan, and I'm very thankful that you're here. I want to share today about how to see God have your dreams come to pass. And it's a, it's a pathway that I struggle with through the years is how do I allow God to work in my life and how do I work with God in seeing the things that He told me come to pass. And many times we struggle because the direction God leads us is opposite than the direction of our dreams. And it's very important that we understand who's in charge of making your dreams come to pass. And especially as we've been learning about transformation, uh, the more I've learned about transformation through the years, I've realized that I was born again and how powerful that was. That when I accepted Jesus, I became a new creation. Old things passed away. Uh, I used to make fun of people who'd come to me and say, um, you need to wish me a happy birthday. And I'd say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know it was your birthday. I didn't realize, social media didn't tell me it was your birthday. And uh, they say, well, it's not my natural birth. It's my born again set day of celebration. They're celebrating the day that they were born again. And I would kind of just pat them on the head and say, oh, that's so cute. Happy birthday. And just kind of snickered a little bit like that's kind of a little too spiritual to me. But, but I'm learning, and as I've learned that how wrong I was and how correct they were, that I have been born again. And the day I was born again was really the day that I was created by God. And so you have two births. The first birth was of your natural, natural man. It was of the will of God. A baby comes into existence at the, create, at the conception. And at that moment, a creature is, is created that's going to live for eternity. Christy and I have two creatures that we created, Harrison and Ava. And they're going to exist for eternity. And praise God, they're born again and they've accepted Jesus in their heart. And so we'll spend eternity together. And uh, once a, a person is created, they don't stop existing. They either end up with God or in, in the lake of fire. So get born again if you're not born again. I'm going to read out of first or out of John chapter one, the book of John chapter one, and we'll just start here. It says here, uh, John writes. I'll start in verse 11. He came to his own, talking about Jesus, and his own did not receive him. And as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So I want us just to confirm that your first birth was of the will of man, a natural birth. Uh, you were a natural creature of the human race. And when you were born again, you became a new creation. And you, you left behind all that you were in the first birth. And so I'm bringing this up because many people have this idea, Christians have this idea, and I struggled with it for years as the Holy Ghost began to navigate me out of that philosophy. The idea that God's purpose in my life is to make my dreams and my purposes come to pass. But when we realize that your first birth wasn't of His will, that He didn't decide to place you into your family, He didn't decide what time, uh, what generation, what country you were born of, He found you in the human race. Your second birth was of His will. That's when He created you. So in your first birth in your family, you had dreams and, and understanding and purposes that came from your natural birth, your first birth, that God had nothing to do. So many of us, whenever we found Christ, had already felt a direction in life, a, a purpose in life that was all of our natural man. But God wants to have the right to, to share His dreams with you, His purpose with you, and not just come alongside of who you were made the first time. He wants to come alongside of who He made you. And so in that understanding of transformation, you could have two sets of dreams, one of the natural man and one of the spiritual man, one that God has for you. And it's very important to know that God will not come and 
and encourage the dreams that He did not give you. And to be able to know what is Him and what is of the natural man. And this it causes a lot of, of struggle for many Christians because they find themselves pursuing something that God doesn't want them to have or hasn't said it's okay to have it yet. I can't tell you how many preachers came to me in my youth, especially trying to tell me how to see God work in my dreams, that God wants your dreams to come to pass, what you're calling, what are you supposed to do? Well, go do it. Go make it happen. Go and do. The Bible says to go and do, to go out into all the world and preach the gospel. So what's on your heart? What country do you feel? What's your mission? Go and make it happen and God will help you. And so I want to just start with the understanding that you can actually have two sets of dreams. One is the dream of your natural man, which God will want you to mortify because it wasn't from him. And one is the dreams that he gave you and the calling that he gave you and the purpose that he gave you at your second birth, at your born again experience. And many Christians will, will never see God make their dreams come to pass. They'll always be pursuing their dreams, trying to chase after it. And I'll share some stories today about how I struggled with that when God's direction was opposite of where the dreams that he gave me came from. So let's start over in Habakkuk. We're going to the Old Testament. Habakkuk, we'll go here first. And I'm going to read uh, chapter 1, verse 5. And here the Lord says this, Look among the nations and watch. Be utterly astounded, for I'll work a work in your days which you would not believe, though it were told you. So there's a part of God in his calling where he wants to do the work. He wants you to watch him do the work. He wants to do things through you. And not so much you doing things for God. And this is a philosophy that transformation has brought into my life. Understanding that God wants to work through me. Whereas before my philosophy was, I'm going to work for God. I'm going to do things in the name of God. Let me think of all the good things I can do all the people I can help, all the money I can give, all the time I can give in the name of God and help Him with His kingdom. In transformation, you understand that you're a new creation and that your life belongs to Him. And He wants to take you step by step into His purpose, into His plans. Where I see much of the church world under the philosophy of trying to fulfill a purpose in you, and that purpose usually is from the natural man, and God didn't give you the okay to do it. I'm going to go over to Ephesians now, a New Testament example. And we're going to go to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 in verse 20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. So here we see that the pattern that God wants for us is for Him to do things for us and through us. Not so much us doing things for Him, for His kingdom. And it's important because to, to have God work through you means that you have to let go of the right and the power of your dreams. You have to let go of the power to make your dreams come to pass. You can't let your dreams guide you and lead you. Now, I know this sounds contrary to a lot of preaching, but really, if you're going to obey God, you can't obey your dreams. And, and I've, I've seen people say, well, God gave me a prophecy to go to a nation, so now I'm going to go, go to that nation. Well, that's okay, but did He tell you to go to that nation when you went, or are you trying to make it happen because God gave you a glimpse of your future? My story is, is when I was starting out uh, in my 20s, I was learning to pray in tongues. And one morning when I was at the church, I would go to the church every morning early. And I had a key to the church. And I'd go to the church and I'd pray in the sanctuary. And I was on the stage. And, and I was walking back and forth praying in tongues, just taking my time, 
put in my time praying in the Holy Spirit. And as I was walking, I would walk one way, turn and come back and back and forth. And all of a sudden I turned and there I was standing in this kind of a live vision. Uh, the floor turned into a map of Canada. And, and if you know anything about uh, the world map, there's some world maps where the Canada is pink. And in this vision, that's how I knew it. The, the map of Canada I was standing on was pink, and I was walking back and forth. Canada has provinces and territories. And I was just walking back and forth from the east to the west, east coast to the west coast. It was exciting. Here I was praying in the Holy Spirit, just walking, and I could actually see the map of Canada under my feet. And I just kept praying. I, I was just learning as I was praying and uh, walking on a pink map. And, and then after a while, I turned and I was in a neighborhood. I was in the back alley behind the houses of, of a, a neighborhood. There was houses and yards and, and I, fences and I walked. And then every time I turned, uh, I was in a new neighborhood, back and forth, back and forth. Every time I turned, I was in a new neighborhood in Canada. And I knew at that moment that God's calling in my life, my future, contained a work in Canada. And uh, I was excited because, you know, I'm from Canada and I love Canada. And my, my, to know that God had a purpose for me to, to see God move in Canada really excited me. And as I um, kept turning the neighborhood, kept changing, I also knew uh, instinctively, or the Lord showed me I'm, instinctively that that also meant that I would, had something to do with either, uh, at the time I thought television, I'm, I can't say that for sure, but at the time I thought this has to do with television, to be all across Canada and all the neighborhoods in from the West Coast to the East Coast had to do with TV. And um, so I thought, wow, that's great. I don't know how it's going to happen, but that's wonderful. Um, and that was God telling me, Mark, in my future. Now, see, there, if you're of the philosophy of, I'm going to go do what God told me to do, then right away you start shopping for opportunities that have to do with Canada, with television, that kind of thing. Because it matches with the vision and the dream that God gave you. And I'm talking specifically today about how to see, how to have God make your dreams come to pass. And what I'm trying to share is the idea that when God gives you a dream, it doesn't mean it's your job to go make it come to pass. That you have to come to a place where you get excited about that dream and know that that's where God's going to take you. And what God will see happen in your life if you stay with Him and stay following Him. But it's not your job to make it come to pass. Just because God gave you a dream and a prophecy and, and He didn't give you a direction. The dream is to tell you this is what will happen to you if you stay the course, if you continue to grow and mature and continue to, to fulfill your steps day by day. This is what will happen to you. I see many Christians, so many uh, chase after their dream and even the dream that God gave them declaring God told me this is what I'm supposed to do, therefore I'm supposed to go do it. And they start to shop around for opportunities and, uh, and start to navigate towards them. And I've seen so many of them fail and struggle their whole life, never seeing it come to pass because they have taken the dream that God gave them and, and owned it and assumed it was an assignment for them to do that. And I see that so much in churches today, to go win souls, to go feed the poor. These are all great things that are important to do. But we are to be led of God, which means that there are some poor people that God may not want you to feed. There are some people that may, God may not want you just to share uh, Jesus with. Maybe they're, they're a family member of a preacher who's backslidden, and they, they, they've heard Jesus their whole life, and the last thing... They need to hear for God to rescue them. Is some someone telling them about Jesus? Just because you see uh, where God wants us to go doesn't mean we're supposed to just go there and make it happen. 
And because of that philosophy of go and do, um, uh, one of my one preacher I heard I loved it actually was, you know, God's uh, the first two letters of God is G O, and the last two are O D. If you turn that around, that spells go and do. That we're to go and do the gospel. We're to go out and win the nations, and so we we negotiate together. And what's happened is we begin to, in our own natural ability rally together and try to do something good for the kingdom of God. I'm not saying God's against that, but I am saying that's not God's best. God's best is for you, you, as an individual, to take the time to grow and mature in Him and to listen to His instructions and allow Him to work through you to do the things that He has asked you to do. and Not so much to go do things for Him, and it sounds similar, but they're completely opposite. And what, when I learned about this was when I had the dream of Canada, the vision. I saw it. I knew that had to do with my calling. I was excited. And, and I began to think about places in Canada that were, where he might want me to go and have a church. And wouldn't you know that an opportunity, a wonderful, amazing incredible opportunity rose up where I was asked to to possibly pastor a church uh, by man by a couple that I really admire and love and respected and I had such love and respect for them that I wanted to please them I wanted to prove to them that I was faithful to God and make them proud and they had they had offered an opportunity and I had other many opportunities to go to Canada to pastor to, to minister, uh, and this one opportunity was to come and pastor and to be on television across Canada every weekend for free. That, that was amazing, and it was everything that God told me I was going to do. It was amazing. It was exactly a perfect fit, but the puzzle came when I was sitting with this one couple and again, I love them. I still love them and honor them and appreciate them. But in my heart, in my spirit, I had no approval of God. Uh, nothing in me would let me take that step. And it was exactly what God told me to do. And so you can understand how I was puzzled, like, wait a minute, this is, God, didn't you open this door? Didn't you make this happen? Uh, isn't this what you have for me? Shouldn't I take the step? But yet inside of me, I had, in my spirit, I had a no. This is not the way I want to make this happen. And I had to decide pretty quick, uh, do I step forward into this opportunity or do I have to decline it and disappoint this couple who gave me this beautiful opportunity? And I had to decline it. And it wasn't that I was doing anything fantastic and had better opportunities. I was, I was in a place in my life at the moment where I was serving and not doing a lot of preaching. And it wasn't glamorous. And this opportunity was amazing. And I had to say no because I was being led by the Spirit, led by the Holy Ghost. And again, I want to say thank God for praying in tongues. Do you know when you pray in tongues, you pray out the perfect will of God? And that means that when you come to a decision, if you pray that out the will of God, you'll be, it'll be easier for you to know what God's will is, even if it doesn't make sense. And if I were to be a pursuer of dreams that God gave me, I would have jumped on that opportunity. But God had a different pathway to that dream than, than the opportunity that was in front of me. It's important because this is how you're led by the Spirit. Not by chasing or fulfilling or making even your prophecies come to pass. The visions that God has for you, when you know it's God, it's still not your job to make it come to pass. Your job is to grow in Him, mature in Him, and then listen and obey. That's why I always say we don't make decisions by opportunity or out of frustration. Uh, many Christians will be frustrated because they don't see God using them the way they think they should be where they're at. 
So they, they get frustrated, so they go find somebody who will put them to work or not. They'll open the door. And other ones, they'll pray, Lord, open the door that no man can shut. And if a door opens up and it's, it's positive, it's forward towards what they want, that's blessing. Uh, they say, God opened this door, praise God, I'm going to walk through it. But the devil can open doors for you, and the man can open doors for you. Uh, the world can open doors for you, and it may not be God. And sometimes the doors that God opens for you is in the opposite direction of, of the very dream that He gave you. That's why it's so important that we pursue Him and not our dreams. The very dreams that He gave you. I used to preach when I was a youth pastor, especially to the young ladies. When I would preach, I'd say, Girls, always remember that the devil will send an Ishmael before he send an Isaac. And I was referring to Abraham uh, and Sarah. They had you know, created an Ishmael uh, and instead of an Isaac. And before your Isaac comes, girls, the devil will send you an Ishmael to try to get you to grab onto him and ruin your life or make your life hard. But I've learned since then, you know, thank God I don't preach the same as I did when I was 19. <laughs> but I've learned since then that the devil didn't create Ishmael. That Ishmael was created, let's, let's go there, let's go to Galatians. I'll just read a verse or two out of Galatians for you. Galatians uh, ch chapter 4. Verse 21, Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondwoman, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and he of the free woman through promise. So here is two sons of Abraham, one of the flesh, and one of the promise, okay? Which things are symbolic? For there are two covenants, one in Mount Sinai, in which gives birth to bondage, which is Hagar. Uh, for this Hagar in Mount Sinai is Arabia, and corresponding to Jerusalem, which is now is in bondage with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free. So now he's saying the two sons can represent uh, a covenant of the Old Testament versus uh, the new covenant of Jesus' salvation through Christ, uh, which is of Jerusalem above, is free, which is the mother of us all. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren, you who do not bear, break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For the de desolate has many more children than she who has a husband. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. So he's comparing now the, the Jewish people who are not saved, that they're under bondage, they are uh, they're of the old covenant compared to those who are born again, uh, are children of promise. But look at verse 29 here. But he who is born according to the flesh, then persecuted, uh, him who was born according to the Spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what does the Scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So here in context, he's talking about salvation through Christ versus trying to serve God through the law. But he says, the word said, the Lord said, cast out the bondwoman and her son. So what was created through the flesh, God did not accept. And I see many people creating things in the name of God through their flesh, trying to serve God, but it's through the flesh. And it's very important, this line, because I don't want you to get to heaven and say, God, here's all my great works that I did for you. And God say, well, thank you for doing those, but those were through the flesh. I didn't ask them you to do that. 
uh, I didn't do that through you. You did that. And all those works burned into dust. You don't get the reward that God really has planned for you. Abraham had a dream that God gave him. His actual name was Abram. And God told him, you will be the father of many nations. And to help him to have that dream, he actually changed his name to Abraham, father of many nations. And, and that way, every time someone called his name Abraham, it reminded him of the dream that God gave him. The dream that God gave Abraham was that he was going to birth a son. And, and because of that birthing of the son, he'd be the father of many nations. But it was important to God that that son was birthed in faith because it allowed God, the father, to birth his son in faith, Jesus. And so it couldn't be a birthing of the natural means. And Abraham tried with Sarah to create a son, but she was barren. And they tried and tried. And Sarah was getting a little bit discouraged as she got older. And technically, there's a law at that time that said whatever uh, you own, as, I mean, talking about a slave, if you have a slave, that slave, you own that slave. And everything that that slave owns, you own. So the slave owns nothing. So technically, Sarah came up with the idea, I have the servant Hagar and and. Abraham, if you lie with her, then then go ahead and, and create yourself a baby with her, and I'll own it. I will own that baby. That baby will belong to me. So the baby that they created was Ishmael. And, and Abraham uh, knew Hagar, biblically knew Hagar, and, and they created, which tells you that Abraham's body worked. At that age and he created an Ishmael so it wasn't that the devil created an Ishmael the devil didn't send an Ishmael to Abraham Abraham in his attempt to make God's dream come to pass using what ability they had skills they had uh, technically what they had uh, Abraham created his own son an Ishmael and gave it to God and God said, I will not accept that as the promise. And so God rejected Ishmael, even though they tried to make it happen in the name of God. They created the Ishmael, not the devil. And I see many people who give up on, on waiting for God. God will make you wait. I'm telling you, God will make you wait. And that's what happens to me all the time where... I get impatient, wanting to see God's purpose come to pass. And the only place I can go is to the Holy Spirit. I can only go to God to make those dreams come to pass. I can't go and rally people together and make things happen because my hands of the flesh have been tied to allow God's purpose to come to pass. His dreams have to be given to me, not me make them happen. Uh, just because God gave you a dream doesn't mean He wants you to make it happen. That's the story of Abraham and, and, and Hagar and Abraham and Sarah and Ishmael was don't make your dream happen in the flesh because God will reject it. It's not of God. God wants us to allow Him by faith to make our dreams come to pass, which means if I want to see things happen quicker, I need to go spend more time with God and grow and mature in God so I can give him what he needs in faith for him to bring it to pass uh, by faith and not by my own works. Let's look a little bit more at uh, the story of Abraham. I'm going to go to Genesis here. You know I'm preaching when I go all the way to the beginning of the book. Genesis chapter 22. We'll just start there. Genesis 22. This is very interesting because Abraham was able with Hagar to create Ishmael. So his body worked. And it wasn't until Abraham's body was so aged that it didn't work. 
that God said, now I want you and Sarah to have, my, have that son. Now I want that dream to come to pass. So it wasn't until their bodies, both his and Sarah's, didn't work, that God said, now I want you to, to make the dream come to pass. You know what that means? That God was saying, I need your faith and not your works. I need your belief and not your actions. I need your obedience and not your activities. And, and, and I'm telling you, this transformation message is causing me to conflict with much of my early beginnings of training how to uh, serve God. Because it's forcing me to accept that anything that God does in my life, in, in the sense of my calling, I want Him to bring it to pass. And I have to wait on Him to bring it to pass. And what do I do when I wait? I grow and mature so that he can, he can do what he has always wanted to do. When, he, when they created uh, Isaac, it was by faith. It was the impossible. An impossible miracle happened. Both of their bodies were so old and, and no longer can naturally produce a child. That's when God said, now I want you to produce a child for me. And they did. By faith, they created for themselves, uh, 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 Isaac, through faith in God, a miracle son, a miracle child, to whom the promise would come to pass that I'll make you the father of many nations. And then we read here in chapter 22, and, and is this is so important, so important for us to understand this, because it'll help you to know what to do when God's direction from His Spirit when God leads you in an opposite way from your dreams. Many, many, I'd say multiple times in my walk with God, opportunities would rise to go into my dreams, my calling, but God's direction would lead me in an opposite way. And, and I'd have to choose, do I chase the dream or do I follow the leading of the Spirit? And here is a story of Abraham which is very similar. They've already been through the whole, whoops, we made an Ishmael, and, and then believed God until they made an Isaac. Now they have Isaac, their son, in their hands. They're, they're allowing him to grow up. They're, they have their son. Sarah has her boy. Uh, Abraham has the boy, the promise of God, that you will be the father of many nations. And then God says this, chapter 1, or chapter 22, verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abram, Abraham, and he said, here I, here I am. He said, now take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And Abram, Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood and burnt offering and arose and went to the place which the Lord God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young man, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Now he says the lad, that means a young man. It's very important that we understand that, that Isaac wasn't a baby. He wasn't a two-year-old. Uh, some say he was 18 years old, at least 18 years old. Some say even up to age 37. We're not positive, but he was at least 18. I, my guess would be he'd be 33, because this is the story that allowed Jesus to come, that God found a man named Abraham who could birth, who birthed this son by faith, so that God the Father can birth a son, Jesus, by faith. And he found a man, Abraham, willing to lay his son's life down and sacrifice his son, so that God legally could, could take his son, Jesus, and sacrifice him. And he found a young man, uh, um, who was willing, Isaac was willing to yield over and allow his life to be sacrificed. The same way that Jesus then was able to 
give up his life for the will of his father. So Isaac went with, with Abraham willingly, and he wasn't a young baby. He was a young man at least. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on, on Isaac his son and took the fire in his hand and the knife and two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here I am, here I am, I am my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. So the two of them went together. This is a prophecy of Jesus, actually. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in, in order, and he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife. This is very important. Abraham took out his hand and took the knife and to slay his son. So Abraham lifted up the knife and was getting ready to bring it down and to, to slay his son. That tells you that in his heart, Abraham had already uh, killed his son. That in his heart, he had already accepted that this was what he was going to do. It wasn't until he passed that moment where he proved that he was willing to do the deed of, of killing his son uh, in obedience to God. Uh, verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, or more like Abraham, <laughs> Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know you fear God, since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. And then we know that God sent him a ram and as the sacrifice. Well, I am bringing together Abraham's story with your story, that God has given you dreams and has a plan and a dream for you, and he gave it to you. And if you don't know what it is yet, that's our prayer for you to find it. But it's not to be led by your dreams. I think one of the reasons that God doesn't want us to be led by our dreams is because if we pursue our dreams, we can be satisfied by the work that we do in the name of the Lord. And the Lord doesn't want you to be satisfied with that. He wants to be the one that satisfies you, not your dreams, not your calling, not the work that you do. He doesn't want the purpose to be what fulfills you. It does fulfill you, but He doesn't want that to be where you find your fulfillment. He wants to be the one that you seek after. He's jealous. He wants you to find your strength, your hope, your love, your, your, uh, your self-worth, your value in Him, not in what you do for Him. And many Christians, they don't, they don't go that far. They hold on to their dream and their purpose and, their, and, and the things that God told them, and they chase it. And, and what did God do with Abraham? Right when Abraham uh, had the dream of a son come to pass and had it in his hand, the dream, that God gave him and helped make it come to pass. What did God do? I want you to kill it. I want you to kill the dream that I gave you. But God, you gave me this son. You gave me this child. It was by faith. We went through all that already. Why would you want me to kill it? Well, that's going to happen to you. It's happened to me that the very dream that God has given to me, the very plan of God that he's given to me, he asked me to kill it, that I don't pursue it. I acknowledge it. That's where I'm going to go. I know that one day, uh, somehow, that God will see me if I continue to grow in Him and mature with Him. It's not automatic. You have to follow Him. But by faith, I know one day that God will uh, take me to a place where I will go across Canada from the East Coast to the West Coast back and forth into all the neighborhoods in Canada. And uh, there's a ministry there that will happen one day. It's not my job to make it happen. It's my job to follow God every day and trust that when He sees it, the timing is right, when He knows that I'm mature enough and grown enough, that that's when He will bring my dream that He gave me to pass. 
and he will do it for me, not me do it for him. God will ask you to take your dream, the very dream he gave you, and he's going to ask you to kill it. Take a knife and I want you to just stab it right in the heart. I want you to kill it because I don't want your dream fulfilling you. I don't want you making you my dream come to pass for me. God's dream for you is where you're going to go. I see many people get a prophecy about where they're supposed to go and they chase it. They won't do anything else. I, I can't tell you how many people, they get so focused on their, you know, uh, hey, we need we need you to go this way. No, I only do what I'm called to do. And and I only I only I'm a prophet. I don't I don't do helps. I don't clean toilets. I don't sweep floors. I only prophesy. That's all I'm going to do because God called me to be a prophet. Unless God told you that, you should be a servant who prophesies, not a prophet who doesn't serve. Anyways, laying down of your dreams, letting go of your dreams, letting go of chasing your dreams, following your dreams. God's role in your life isn't to make your dreams come to pass. Number one, some of the dreams you have may be from your first birth, the person you were born before you were saved. And God may not want have, have any of that for you because He rebirthed you and you were born and created of God. The dreams from you, from your rebirth, may be opposite. It's amazing. They may be opposite of your first birth. So don't just expect that the way that I think I am is who God made me. You want to grow up in God. That's the transformation message, that you've been born of God. Grow that man up. Grow that person up in God and let God walk that person while you mortify the desires and deeds of the outward man. So number one, the dreams that may be in your life from your childhood may not have anything to do with what God's called you to do. As I say, just because you're six foot nine doesn't mean you're called to play basketball. But there are dreams and purposes that God has for you, His child. And then when He gives them to you, He's going to ask you to not chase them, but to chase Him. Because He wants to bring them to you. And so many believers never experience the amazing miracle that can happen on a daily basis where God begins to uh, bring things to pass for you, His plan, His purpose, through you and for you, and not you make them happen. So many believers are so busy making the kingdom of God happen, they never experience this walk where God makes things happen through them and let me just tell you, God can do more through you in a moment than you can do through a lifetime of trying to make things happen. And, and, and I, I honestly believe that this lack of vision of transformation is why the church has been limited in the power and in, in fulfilling the Great Commission is because too many churches, too many people, too many Christians are trying to make God's purpose come to pass rather than grow up in God, mature in God, mature in the love of God, mature in faith in God, and allow Him to bring things to pass, His will to pass through them and for them. Whatever dream God's given to you, if you don't have it yet, we're going to pray that you'll begin to see it. Uh, whatever dream He's given to you, is not your job to make it happen. It's your role to grow up in God and obey Him and when He leads you in a direction that's different than your dreams, when He pulls you away from opportunities into things that don't seem to make any sense, you have to trust Him and obey Him because it's His dream, not yours. He's given it to you as an uh, assignment and as a, a sign that if you follow Him, it will come to pass. But you got to follow Him. you got to keep praying, keep seeking Him and obey His voice. Let's chase God and not our dreams. I'm going to pray for you. Uh, let's pray together. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you that our life is in your hands, our steps are guided of you, that our future is in your hands. Uh, everything we have in this life is yours. Our, our steps, our days, our hours, all of it belongs to you. 
that we let go of the reins of our life, the control of our life, and we give you the reins and the control of our life. And our, our role is to obey you, to listen and obey. So Father, for those of us who, who struggle because we don't see where we're going, we don't see the future, we don't see the possibilities, my prayer is that you open up uh, their dreams, you open up their eyes to see the wonderful wonderful things you have in front of them that there's no lesser child in your family that all of us are important all of us are a very important part of your family and every calling is equally as important so father that you open up their spiritual eyes to see the future you have for them as they obey you that they'll see the wonderful incredible things that you plan to work through their faith and their obedience and then, Father, I also pray for those of us who are chasing after you and following you, that you give us your grace and strength to let go of opportunities, let go of our dreams, the very dreams that it's not our job to make it come to pass, to trust you and to walk with you, that you put your grace on us and your strength on us in those moments uh, where it just seems like what a great opportunity I have to let go of to obey God. But Father, you lead our steps. Your grace is our strength. And the things that you plan to do through each of us is amazing. Help us to dream big in you. Help us to believe big in you. To know that, that we are part of an end time revival. That we are part of a great work, a great body of Christ that has many, many great things to do. That you will do it through us, not us do it for you. So help us, Father, every day to chase after you. We give you our dreams. We give you our purpose. We give you our life. Our, our life is in your hands. That we'll do whatever you ask when you ask it. In Jesus' name, your grace now is on us. Amen. It can be a hard moment, especially when you start to lay your dreams down. Once you live in this life, it's hard to pursue anything but God's will. But it's a life of victory, a life of miracles. It's a life of incredible moments where God does things for you that you don't deserve. And, and you're shocked at how he does it. What God will do through you and for you is what you want. Let's chase God and not our dreams. I love you. Thank you for spending time with me. I'll see you again soon. God bless you.